and yes, and uh, so um, welcome to tonight's event uh, with Patrizia Pietroniro, who will lead us uh, into the third uh, chapter of this uh, third, um, let's say, leg of this journey into Friuli Venezia Giulia. But before I say, before we start our tour there, uh, let me also remind you that um, on July the 6th, uh, Thursday, it's, it will be, a, uh, sorry, July the 6th, uh, Wednesday, I think it's, it's a Wednesday, at 6.30 p.m. we'll have this beautiful celebration of Italian summer with uh, events both in English and in Italian. We'll talk uh, about very different and interesting topics uh, concerning Italian culture and traditions, for example, the rice fields and the best kept secrets about mm. rice varieties uh, and how to make the best risotto with them. Mm. Or uh, we'll talk about Italian frescoes, the art of Italian frescoes, the exotic flora of Sicily, and also about Florence in the 60s. Uh, recounted by a young Canadian who was a, a young Canadian then uh, who visited the city and also was a student of Italian so it, it would be nice to because then he has also been he has also been back to Florence nowadays so it will be interesting to see the comparison between hmm. you know, Florence in the 60s and Florence nowadays so uh, without much further ado, let me uh, leave the podium to Patrizia. And also let, uh, let me remind you that the fourth leg of this journey will be on, on June 29th. So I stop sharing here and I leave it to you, Patrizia. Thank you. Okay, good. So good evening. Uh, thank you, Arianna for your introduction and uh, many thanks to all participants to be here this evening, uh, despite uh, the warm slash uh, uh, hot temperatures of these days, uh, at least here in uh, Vancouver. I appreciate your great uh, interest for this hidden Italian corner, Friuli Venezia Giulia, maybe not so hidden anymore after our two webinars. So let's continue our journey in the region, in the city of Gorizia, uh, along the border with Slovenia. So we can say that uh, it's uh, official Gorizia in Italy and the Nova Gorica in Slovenia will be the 2025 European capital of culture. This is a very important title for both cities for the first time the capital of culture will be stretched across two countries. It's a great opportunity for the development of this area uh, in terms of uh, uh, tourism, uh, financial resources, culture and jobs, of course. In 2025, all attention will be focused on the whole region, Friuli Venezia Giulia. It's a unique chance to show itself in the world. It's a peculiar mix of Italian, Austrian and Slovenian history. So for that occasion, hundreds of uh, uh, cultural events have been planned and uh, more than 60 projects uh, as a result of a cross-border cooperation uh, between uh, uh, the two uh, countries, the two cities. A huge interest for the cultural, gastronomical and social uh, aspects of this area is also demonstrated by many great uh, filmmakers who have chosen these wonderful locations for their movies, for example, I remember La Grande Guerra, the great war with uh, uh, two famous Italian actors, uh, Marcello Mastroianni and Alberto Sordi. So let's move on and uh, we can have a look to our agenda. Uh, of course, we will talk about Gorizia, <clears throat> which was called the Miss of the Adriatic for uh, for the um, a warm uh, climate uh, of, uh, of the city, uh, the medieval castle, the history concerning the Great War, because Gorizia faced two 
um, conflicts, uh, two uh, huge conflicts. We will talk about the, uh, the natural environment uh, that we have here in this area, which is the karst. In Italian, we say carso. And of course, we talk about the First World War, the, the trenches, uh, which uh, is a symbol of the Great War and the uh, huge, uh, massive monuments uh, uh, like uh, Redipuglia, which is the largest uh, war memorial in Italy. Uh, Gorizia is called also the Berlin of Italy because for a long time, for about 40 uh, years, it was divided by a wall in two parts. And, uh, but we will talk also about uh, uh, a World Folk Festival that uh, um, uh, every year is hosted in the city at the end of August. Of course, not now for the pandemic, but uh, uh, it will restart again probably next year. And um, we'll talk about uh, the Collio, the white wine heaven that we have here in the surroundings of the city. And uh, uh, last but not least, uh, we go to the coastline with Grado, which is called the mother of Venice. So um, Venezia Giulia includes uh, the province of Gorizia and uh, Trieste, as you can see in this map, an area with a complete different history from Friuli. The two cities, belonged to the Austrian-Hungarian Empire for many centuries until 1918, until the end of the First World War. The fascinating city of Gorizia is in the southeast of the region, bordering with Slovenia and the Adriatic Sea, uh, surrounded by lovely hills and crossed by the uh, amazing uh, Isonzo River that um, I can show you later in a video. It is a very complex history facing two world wars and the division uh, of, uh, of, the, of this uh, uh, city, Gorizia, on one side in Italy and Nova Gorica in Slovenia on the other side. However, it is also the land of outstanding wines and a wonderful coastline, as I said, as I mentioned before. <clears throat> so, uh, Gorizia, the niece of the Adriatic, since the beginning of the 19th century, the Austrian upper class loved to stroll through the streets of the town. It is not a surprise that it was called uh, the Austrian Nice or the Nice of the Adriatic for the beauty of the, of the landscape and the mild uh, climate that we have here. It was a welcoming center for the Austrian retired um, nobleman. Uh, this was the time uh, when uh, the city was trying to become a, a tourist destination for uh, uh, aristocrats, uh, for aristoc um, aristocracy, by promoting the creation of parks, hotels, uh, uh, coffee houses, uh, and uh, other shops uh, in, um, we can say in a middle European and multi-ethnic uh, uh, atmosphere. Uh, even if we should say that this uh, uh, atmosphere only few years later was uh, swept away by the destruction of the Great War. Anyway, despite the transformations that followed uh, the First World War, the city maintains, uh, uh, preserves many green areas uh, to which have been added in the last years, new parks and playgrounds. Also, there is a long history of the Jewish community we can see uh, here also in one of those pictures, the synagogue, which had a strong economic role when the Austrian emperor, uh, Joseph II, abolished the ghetto and all forms of discrimination. So Jewish were allowed in the city to enroll at university and uh, do any kind of work instead of uh, carrying, uh, instead of uh, 
carrying on only some specific activities as it was in other cities, for example, in Venice or in other, but, but not only in Italy, in Europe in general. Uh, so we can really say that Gorizia was a multi-ethnic uh, uh, town, uh, Italian, Venetian, Slo uh, Slovene, Friulian and German were all languages spoken in the city center at that time. It was really a cosmopolitan uh, center despite uh, it is uh, a small city. Let me show you a video about yeah Okay, so let's talk about uh, the city center and the, glory, the castle, the medieval castle. As you can see in the picture is high above uh, the city. The castle lies up on a hill overlooking the two sides of the town. Uh, there is uh, Gorizia uh, in Italy on one side and Nova Gorizia on the other. You can have a great view from the massive walls of the, of the castle, of the ancient building, and you can also admire the hills of the Collio. Collio is uh, the name of the prime uh, wine region, and uh, on the top of the hill you can also uh, see very well the huge memorials of the Great War. Uh, inside uh, this ancient uh, building, there are interesting artifacts. 
of the medieval ages, some rooms also displaying early mu musical instruments. Uh, you can visit the jail cells, uh, the castle kitchen, uh, and the foodstuff uh, warehouses. For the history lovers, worth every minute spent there, uh, a very uh, medieval feeling inside. From the 11th century, uh, Gorizia was the seat of an independent county until uh, it passed to Austria in the 16th century. There are many museums worth visiting, such as the First World War Museum or the Museum of Fashion. And there are also many pleasant opportunities and spaces in which to do everything from hiking and cycling uh, uh, or riding along the uh, Isonzo Valley, the hills of the Collio and uh, amazing vineyards uh, and also small ancient uh, uh, villages. So let me show you this video. <clears throat> Yeah. And now let's talk about the Great War. Yeah, the, the Great War, because Gorizia was uh, not on the front line uh, during the first 10 months uh, of the Great War. But uh, after some time, it was involved. Um, as soon as Italy entered the war in May uh, 1915, uh, Gorizia found itself in the center of one of the largest uh, uh, battlefields. The strong uh, conflict between Italy and the Austrian-Hungarian armies. Um, um, so now we are going to discover one of the most important pages of our uh, 20th century. It was uh, one of the most tragic episodes uh, in the whole history of the mankind. Millions of people were involved. Uh, the reasons for that, um, it was an explosion of all the tensions that had been uh, accumulating over the years in Europe. Uh, a there was also political and uh, economic competition among um, uh, three, uh, uh, three countries, England, France, and Germany. At first, Italy was, uh, we can say in Italian, uno, uno spettatore interessato, an interested spectator, economi economically uh, less developed compared to the other countries. And uh, the idea 
to join the war began to gain uh, support on the newspapers, on the Italian newspapers, and uh, during public uh, meetings uh, in order to um, convince the Italian population uh, that uh, the war was um, a good occasion to become a powerful state, a powerful country. Uh, the hope that this would be only a short uh, conflict disappeared after only a few weeks uh, when several uh, kilometers of trenches were excavated. So let's uh, see now these two maps uh, before and after the, war, uh, the First World War. There was um, an underground political movement working for unification of some territories with Italy. It put forward some uh, important territorial requests, uh, such as Trentino and Venezia Giulia. So Venezia Giulia we uh, uh, refer refers to Gorizia and Trieste. Uh, at the end of the war, uh, the, these territories were occupied by Italian troops again who introduced their own civil administration and became officially part of Italy. If you look at the map on the right, after the war, Italy obtained much more. Other territories such as the Istrian Peninsula were annexed. During the fascist regime, there was a process called Italianization to spread the Italian culture and identity in these uh, uh, conquered uh, territories. All Slavic organizations were closed. The Slovene language was forbidden. The street names were dedicated to famous Italian uh, uh, personalities. Newspapers were allowed only in Italian and several examples of uh, fascist architecture were built everywhere. So few uh, Slovene speaking writers decided to remain, decided uh, to stay. And those few who did were persecuted by the fascism. Many Slovene decided to emigrate to uh, South America and uh, especially to um, Argentina. In order to understand uh, uh, the development of this war, we should talk about uh, uh, the natural environment. Uh, um, in the past, uh, the main vegetation uh, on this area was uh, uh, oaks. But these were replaced by pine forest in the 19th and 20th century. So forests now recover only one third of the karst. And starting in the Middle Ages, the plateau, uh, the Il Carso, the, the Il Carso uh, suffered radical uh, deforestation for economic reasons. Although much uh, of the wood for the spade in the spaced pies, you know, the pies that support the island of Venice came from this region. Venice also uh, managed uh, these uh, forests, the karst forests, as a reserve for naval uh, timber to use the, the wood to build the, 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 the ships uh, in Venice. But the huge deforestation occurred in the mid 19th century uh, due to um, uh, clear cutting by local farmers and uh, in order to convert this land uh, for pastures for, uh, for sheep. So karst is an area of land made up of limestone and lim limestone also known as chalk is a soft rock that dissolves in water. As rainwater seeps uh, into the rock, it uh, slowly erodes. Karst landscapes can be worn away from the top or dissolved from a weak point inside the rock. Um, this is why there are many uh, caves, uh, underground uh, uh, streams and sinkholes in the, uh, on the surface. Where erosion has 
uh, worn away the land above ground, you can see steep rocky uh, cliffs. So if you visit the karst area, there are plenty, many mm, traces of, uh, of the First World War. And uh, you can see the trenches, you can visit them, and you can understand the life of the soldiers the, and the, the life of the soldiers in this challenging uh, environment, which was extremely uh, difficult. Difficult because of diseases, uh, lack of potable water, uh, frequent rain, uh, wounds, and of course, lack of, uh, of medication. So here in the pictures, you can see the uh, one of, uh, of the trenches that you can find in this area. And uh, yeah, uh, it's a long corridor. It's a long corridor, as you can see, le uh, less than two meters deep. But the first question is uh, why so many soldiers died during the Great War? So as I mentioned before, medicine and treatment of disease were not adequate. Uh, antibiotics had not, been, uh, had not yet been uh, uh, invented. We should wait for the antibiotics, we should wait the Second World War, the Americans uh, brought uh, um, those kind of, uh, medica of, of medicines in Europe. So uh, the real main reason was the introduction of new weapons of mass destruction. You can see here in this picture, this is the Schwarzlöse. Schwarzlöse is a machine gun uh, with 600 rounds per minute. They um, were very, very powerful uh, weapons and the soldiers were not, uh, absolutely, they were not prepared for this kind of attacks. And then other kind of attacks ga with gases, uh, we, they, uh, they, um, uh, they use also chemical attacks, hand uh, grenades, uh, they use the airplanes for the first time. So uh, no new military strategies to cope with, this, uh, with these kind of innovations. Uh, through the original walkway, you can move along the trench. And uh, interesting is the, you can see in the picture, the elbow rest used by the soldiers to shoot more uh, precisely, and uh, which is still visible in uh, parts of the, of the trenches. The Italian soldiers were not ready uh, for this war because of lack of uh, winter equipment, hand grenades, means of transport, machine guns, lack of military officers, officers uh, that were well trained, well prepared. So the cars was the theater for huge battles during uh, the First World War. Um, they, but they built, even if you can see this rocky environment, uh, they, um, the soldiers built communication tunnels, trenches, and um, a lot of fortified uh, areas. So if you go today, all these events can be discovered uh, thanks to open air museums and war itineraries. We have interesting walks to understand the soldiers' life and experiences. Like more than one century ago, we can, uh, we can walk along the, uh, the, uh, the, sorry, the trenches, explore the military buildings, and see the, um, the battlefields. A fascinating trip in the past, which continues with the visit of the massive memorials of this conflict. So visitor visitors can still observe the concrete bases, the corridors and the rooms used by the troops who lived in the trenches for weeks or, or months. Uh, you should imagine that about 65,000 uh, workers worked for a long time along this track to build trenches and uh, defensive uh, um, 
uh, outposts, uh, roads, uh, or, or tunnels. But all these extensive works were lost in only a few days. Uh, in October 1917, with the defeat of uh, Caporetto uh, or Kobarid, because uh, now it's in uh, Slovenia, uh, so it has uh, a, a Slovene name. But uh, and for uh, uh, Italians, uh, it's a, uh, this battle is famous with the name of uh, uh, Caporetto, La Disfatta di Caporetto, when the Italian troops were forced to withdraw for 100 kilometers. Yeah. So the first battles of the Isonzo did not achieve the results that were expected, expected and uh, had revealed uh, the lack of preparations by the Italian army uh, to take part in a war based on positional warfare, and that would not last a short time. After the Italians took uh, Gorizia in August 1916, uh, Austrian troops continued to bomb the city. And at the end of 28 months of war, the city was devastated. Only a few buildings survived uh, the war intact. As you can see, the town itself was seriously damaged and most of its inhabitants had been evacuated by early um, 1916. With the Battle of Caporetto in October 1917, the Austrians, helped by the Germans, pushed the Italians back to the Veneto region and the town returned um, under the, the Austrian uh, control. Yeah. And now you can see uh, Redi Puglia. Redi Puglia is uh, Italy's largest uh, memorial dedicated to the soldiers who fell in the Great War. Uh, it was uh, opened in September 1938 after 10 years of uh, uh, construction and inaugurated by uh, Benito Mussolini. Uh, the Duce, the leader of the Italian fascism for 20 years. Uh, 1938 was also the year of the, of the first agreements with, uh, with Hitler and uh, the racial laws against the Jewish. And uh, so it means that a new great war uh, started to be planned. So the message of this uh, imposing massive monuments to the visitors was be ready to a new conflict and be ready to sacrifice your life for Italy again. Um, Redi Puglia uh, um, accommodates the remains of 100,000 soldiers who died in battle in the uh, surrounding areas. As you can see, it is, uh, it is um, disposed, it is uh, um, displayed on three levels, representing the, it's like an army descending from the sky, uh, an army led by its commander and generals. Uh, we can say that this is the representation of the Italian third army, uh, ready to fight uh, against the en its enemy. Uh, there is also, uh, if you go there, if you visit Redi Puglia, you can, uh, you can uh, uh, also visit an interesting museum with plenty of artifacts, objects, uh, uh, weapons found in the battleground, and uh, including a mock-up of a trench line com complete with uh, barbed uh, wire. Um, yeah, Redi Puglia is for sure Europe's most impressive war memorial, uh, evocative, but not um, bombastic. It takes up, as you can see here, it takes up a whole hillside. Uh, we can see in details the majestic tomb with red marble of the commander of the Third Army. Uh, the commander was Emanuele Filiberto, Duke of Aosta. Um, he didn't die 
uh, during the the um, the war, but he had expressed his wish, his willing to be buried here with his soldiers, and behind him, uh, the tombs of his five generals in the um, granite uh, uh, tombs. Yeah, behind them, uh, you can see twenty two large steps rise containing the remains of 40,000 identified soldiers in alphabetical order. On each step, you can read the word presente, present, repeated hundreds of times. The word presente has a double meaning. Um, it means that all the soldiers are present uh, in our memories, but on the other side also the word means, uh, um, is, uh, 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 the word present, present is used by the soldier when he replies saying that I'm ready to, to fight. You know, this is the message that uh, those kind of muni monuments uh, wanted to give. To, to the visitors. So this uh, war memorial is truly outstanding, touching. Most of them were young boys on both sides fighting each other. So it's a really a brave taking event to visit this place uh, and uh, visitors are really impressed and meditate how um, illogical was such a war in which civilized nations uh, sent so many young uh, people to death. Um, and then uh, Gorizia uh, had to face uh, the second war, the Berlin of Italy. After uh, this second conflict, the area of Gorizia was conquered by uh, partisans. And in 1947, most of the territory was uh, um, annexed uh, to Yugoslavia, while a smaller part, including the city, was annexed to Italy. Uh, though a border city, uh, Gorizia was only in part uh, crossed by the border with Yugoslavia. Some important old buildings, uh, once belonging to Gorizia, were included in the Yugoslav territory. So, so these uh, include, uh, uh, for example, the old uh, railway station of the Transalpina. Transalpina was the line that connected uh, Trieste to uh, Fellach, to Austria, uh, as well as the town uh, uh, landmarks, uh, the main sites of the city. So although the situation in Gorizia was often compared with that of uh, Berlin, uh, during the Cold War, Italy and Yugoslavia had good relations uh, regarding uh, Gorizia. So uh, these included uh, cultural and sporting events, for example, uh, that uh, uh, favored the spirit of a um, cohesion of uh, a coexistence that remained in place after Yugoslavia broke up in 1991. So I want to show you a video, how it, uh, yeah. How it was, it's a whole video, but very interesting. It's not well done. Anyway, interesting to see the division physically, you can see the, the you can say in brackets, the wall even if it's not uh... Um, 
Yeah, and this is the Transalpina Square. Um, you, on this map, you can see here the division of, uh, um, of the city in 1947. And uh, on this side, we have the Italian part, uh, where is the castle, uh, the, uh, the downtown, we can say the old, the ancient center. And on the, the new part is Nova Gorica, which is, uh, uh, we can say, a new, a new city. Um, in these two pictures, you can see uh, uh, the first one is a, an old, uh, a uh, picture um, which reminds uh, us uh, the communist period, the communist time. You can see the symbol of the star at the top on the roof of the um, rail station. This is the rail station of the Transalpina. And uh, um, the same building, of course, uh, restored um, after 2004. Uh, 2004 is the year when Slovenia uh, entered in the European community. So we, 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 you don't see uh, the, the um, division, the physical division anymore between, uh, between the two parts. Everything was born here in 1906, when this train station was created by hands of Austrian Empire in a pretty city of East Italy. Different cultures, Italians, Germans and Slovenian were living peacefully. But in year 1915, a First World War ravaged this territory and the Austrian troops were defeated after bloody 12 battles. Almost one million of humans died and the city devastated. Although with a huge sacrifice, Italians conquered again this square. Some years later, military uniforms were again marching here. Another world war was spreading its terror with new bombs and deportations toward concentration camps. However, Democracy always overbears against any dictatorship. Partisans and overseas soldiers brought again the freedom in this defaced land. Allied troops and Yugoslavian army controlled this territory for other two years. After the end of war, a border was traced in the city and it split this square in two countries. It was the beginning of Cold War people, always used to live together, was definitely separated and often moved away from their families. A wall was built here and military troops were deployed for controlling each other. The war finally collapsed in year 2004, but another war in year 2020, not made by traditional weapons, kept people away. However, this last challenge will be for sure defeated, and all people will soon honor this wonderful symbol of freedom and harmony among cultures. They are inspired by local talents in philosophy, and music, architecture, engineering, the art of politics, and physics. Memories of needless devastations and sacrifices, lived personally or passed on by families, 
had forged their passions and studies. That's the borderless square. Traditions and languages are different among countries. However, culture is universal and borderless, as this square. It's not only the cultivation of our mind. Culture is also a bridge toward freedom and democracy. It is a cradle and a shelter that protect us against any war and discrimination. A long path of human evolution and in our future we will tackle new military conflicts and diseases. But in any hard times principles of our fathers and memories of their sacrifices here they will be always firmly guarded as our heritage. That's the borderless square. Yeah. Now, yeah, it's a very touching uh, video, but um, also very uh, relevant to understand the, what uh, happened from the First uh, World War up to now. And uh, as you can see, uh, Slovenia's entry in the European Union in uh, 2004, good relations between the two countries. So it means that you can, uh, in the city, you can breathe the suspended uh, atmosphere, uh, which is typical of a border city. Uh, in the Piazza Transalpina, uh, which until 2004 was physically uh, divided by a wall, you will walk with one foot in Italy and one foot in Slovenia, something amazing. Thanks to its special geographic location, uh, it has always been uh, influ influenced by a combination of uh, different uh, civilizations, uh, Latin, Slavic, and Germanic all together. So situated on the eastern border, it has always played a a, an important uh, role in Central Europe. Uh, the square now is a urban open space in common between the two countries. It's a symbolic, it has um, a symbolic value representing um, the coexistence of two cities and the overcoming of conflicts, not only between uh, two countries, but also between uh, uh, two opposite words. Uh, we can just uh, mention the famous Iron Curtain and uh, the Cold War. I personally saw um, the demolition of the small wall on the square and the celebrations for the end of the border and Slovenia's entry in the European Union, uh, May the 1st in 2004. The title European culture, Capital of Culture is a great opportunity to learn more about the history of the two uh, cities. Uh, they are both ready to prepare many activities and projects with a strong um, European spirit, uh, European dimension that uh, for sure will attract visitors from the whole country, from not only Italy, but uh, also from Europe and uh, will be a positive message for many uh, border areas in the world where there are uh, conflicts and, uh, and uh, wars also nowadays. So we can, uh, Ariana, we can have a break for um, questions or um, 
Yes, I, I just Come needed on. to unmute myself. Yes, there are already some questions and please feel free either to write in the chat or to unmute yourself and just ask directly the question. In the meantime, I will start uh, um, reading the questions that uh, have already been sent um, via um, the chat. The first question was, why is it called King of Puglia? Although Renzo already answered yeah. Not named after King of Puglia, complete the complete town name is Fogliano Re di Puglia. I don't know whether oh. you want to um, to add anything else to that. They answer. are very well prepared. Yes, it's Fogliano Re di Puglia, but actually the origin of the name it comes from a, a, a Slavic word, a, a, a Radipic, which means hill simply hill as you can see it's the natural environment where the monument was was built on the hillside um yeah yeah this is but uh, yeah the, the question um, uh, you know many visitors ask me all the time because it seems that it comes from the king of puglia yeah yes the, and the second question is can uh, by margaret Rudolf, can someone tell me if there were attempts to escape communist Slovenia into Italy, thinking of East and West Berlin, because the wall looks more like a fence, unlike the Berlin Wall, which was a real, yeah. a real wall in yeah. that case. Yeah, they they tried, of course, uh, but it was, of course, very, very dangerous because all uh, that line was uh, um, controlled 24 hours. But uh, I, I would like to say that in the last uh, um, 20 years, uh, many uh, inhabitants uh, of both parts uh, received a special permit, you know, to cross the border. For example, if um, they they were businessmen or farmers, uh, and uh, in order to sell the, their products and uh, to continue the, the the trades, you know, they receive special, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Are there any other questions that you would like to ask directly to Patricia? Please feel free to unmute yourselves if you have. I have a question if no one else has questions. Uh, regard, it regards Patricia, uh, what you were talking about, um, the, the fact that the emperor of the Austro-Hungarian empire abolished the Jewish ghetto. I didn't really get the, the date, or the, uh, exactly the year when this happened. And I was wondering whether it was after the French Revolution, after the Napoleonic War, so after the restoration and, uh, and all, or before that. Uh, it happened uh, 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 during the 18th century, exactly it was uh, 17, 48, I think, something like this. So it was and, before uh, the French Revolution, yes. And, and uh, the Empress, Maria Theresa, uh, the Austrian Empress, uh, continued this kind of, uh, po of, uh, of policy to give freedom, not only to the Jewish community, but also to other, um, uh, to all the um, uh, re religion community, uh, religious communities. Um, actually, it was, uh, uh, it has been done uh, in order to promote uh, uh, the commerce, the trades, you know, uh, mm. and, 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 yeah, it was not actually a very religious reason to do that, but economically, especially economic. So there attract, was not any idealistic... In order to attract, in order to attract uh, sorry, um, a lot of uh, uh, traders, you know, from, uh, from other religions uh, in Gorizia and uh, Trieste as well. Trieste was the only port the only port of the Austrian Empire. Mm. Yes, because it's uh, with the Napoleonic Wars, so Napoleon Bonaparte was the one who abolished the ghettos throughout Europe. But then 
after the the Battle of Waterloo and uh, after his exile, then uh, and after the restoration, the the ghettos were the Jewish ghettos were reinstated reinstated uh, throughout Europe. Yes, and so that was a although it was it was it, it had economic reasons, no, yeah. not ideological reasons, but uh, it was uh, very advanced uh, compared but, yeah, to other absolutely. countries. And we will see the next time, uh, especially in Trieste, if you think that a city with about uh, 200,000 people, so it's not a big city, Trieste, anyway, it's very cosmopolitan also nowadays because it has 17 churches that are not Catholic. Mm -hmm. Something uh, really impressive. Yeah, Absolutely. So there are also the... Mm -hmm. the the orthodox the christian orthodox from the you know from the former uh, ancient roman empire in greece into the the eastern roman empires and so that kind of tradition is still there yes yeah and um, so is go ahead so it, it's Margaret again. I don't want to dominate with my questions, but I find this interesting because I live in Trieste every year for quite a few months and I have origins there. And I've always puzzled about um, the Redipulia. Now, just to confirm, you think it's a translation of the Slavic word for hilltop? Because it, it, you know, it is such a direct translation of King of Puglia. So I'm just wondering if you have to add thank you yeah no it's uh, the italianization of the slavic word uh, yeah yeah it's a, a translation you know in italian from uh, from this uh, slovene uh, word yeah okay thank you yeah, you're welcome so thank you patricia if there are no more questions you can go ahead with the second part of your presentation sure this, thank you the second part uh, mm, we'll talk about uh, wine wine, very special white wine with the collium. But before that, I would like just to spend a few words and uh, remind this great event that for the pandemic the, this year and last year was canceled, but uh, we hope uh, hopefully it will restart from next uh, year. Uh, it's called the World Folk Festival. It's in Gorizia. And um, it, take, it takes place entirely in the city for three days in the city center. And uh, you can uh, enjoy uh, these uh, musical ensembles and the folk, folk groups coming from uh, all over the world. It's, uh, it's really an amazing uh, event. Um, yeah. So let's talk about wine. Yeah. And... Um, Yes, we can say that the best uh, wine comes from the hills. Uh, the best wines, wine comes from the hills. Uh, you uh, might like to explore uh, maybe some native, uh, um, some, uh, some native uh, um, uh, plants. Uh, in Friuli Venezia Giulia, uh, we have this Dock wine, which is produced from 26 different grape varieties. So you can imagine half of them are native varieties, which means they have their origin in the region. Uh, Anish is a sweet wine from uh, Piccolit and Ramandolo. And uh, uh, we have uh, also red varieties like uh, Refosco, Cabernet, Merlot, Pinot, but the most famous uh, ones are the white um, wines, especially uh, the Friulano, it's called Friulano, Ribolla, and Malvasia. These three um, wines are um, native indigenous uh, uh, plants. So, um, Collio is a, is a beautiful hilly area uh, that partially rose into nearby Slovenia between uh, the, the Julian Alps and the Adriatic Sea. Um, it is a small but mixed and uh, fascinating area producing, we can say, some of the best uh, worldwide known white wines. The name Collio is taken from the Italian word Colli, 
which means uh, um, hillsides and describes the, um, the soil of this area. Uh, peculiar landscape is the call, your land of outstanding white wines. It is a series of hills covered by uh, vines. You can follow the Strada uh, del Vino e Ciliegia, the wine and cherries route in the area uh, with stopovers at farms or um, orchards, uh, vineyards and wineries for tasting and drinking. It's amazing. Over 80 Five percent of the production is in white wine grape varieties. Uh, wine has been produced here since ancient times. The cold eastern winds uh, meet uh, uh, the warmness, the warmness of the Adriatic Sea, and the soil consists of uh, marl, um, uh, lime, uh, lime rock. It's a lime rock. Uh, mixed with uh, sandstone, and it's called uh, polka. This is another Slavic name that offers uh, mm, minerals uh, and salinity uh, to the wines. So these conditions provide uh, a, a fast uh, maturation uh, of the wine and offer complex and extremely elegant white wines. Uh, you, uh, you, I would like just to remind you that ancient Greek writers had already mentioned uh, wines which grew in this area. And um, a famous Roman statesman mentioned uh, in a letter that Veneto, Gorizia, and Istria were well blessed regarding the cultivation, uh, the, 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 the conditions, you know, um, for the, uh, the good conditions for the cultivation of, 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 the, of the vines here. So uh, you might like to explore three top native grapes, uh, even uh, uh, the ordinary Tokai Friulano is terrific uh, with its uh, taste of pear, herbs, peach, and citrus, and uh, can be enjoyed with various dishes. Uh, the second one is the Ribola Gialla. It's made 100% from the grape uh, bearing uh, the same name, and the result is a straw yellow wine with a fresh taste enjoyed either with fish or as an aperitif. The last one is uh, uh, Picolite. It's a special sweet wine with flavors of figs uh, and minerals and goes perfectly with um, pastries, uh, aged cheeses, or just alone as vino uh, da meditazione, a you know, meditation uh, wine. Uh, Picolit has a limited production. It's quite expensive, uh, 50, 60 euro, um, euros for, for a bottle. It's very difficult also to find. Uh, if you find it, you're lucky. It is also called the king's wine, as many European royal families enjoyed it in the last centuries. They used to buy the Picolit uh, uh, to, to have it uh, on, uh, on the royal tables. If you go to Friuli Venezia Giulia, do not miss the great experience to taste uh, these indigenous native wines, at least one of, or, 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 at least one of them. Um, yeah. So Collier enjoys a mild climate with summers that are not hot, They're, the are hot but not stifling and winters that are cold and often uh, uh, rainy. There is an excellent diurnal temperature variation. Uh, this means uh, warm sunny uh, days which help bring the grapes to optimal ripeness and uh, uh, we have cool fresh uh, nice to help them retain uh, their acidity. Thanks to the warm winds from the Adriatic Sea, uh, grapes are kept dry and the mountains to the north protect the region from cold winds. Wind. So the environment is excellent for this kind of production. Family-owned boutique wineries. Yeah, unlike 
most other wine zones in Italy, the reputation of Collio for top white wines has been built by small producers who have, who have shown that it is possible to produce world-class uh, white wine from almost unknown local grapes, as well as from international varieties. Some winemakers incorporate, include German wine making techniques like cold fermentation uh, to white wine production. So today the winemaking on the region is very technologically advanced with uh, refrigerated fermentation tanks, modern wine presses uh, and so on in order to maximize the fresh fruit and the characteristic uh, of the grapes. Uh, so these specific production methods help create a style of wine found uh, nowhere else in Italy, and I would like to say in the world. The Collio experience is a highlight with its stunning wines, traditional food, historical elements. But people, of course, uh, are of great, great impo importance to the story. Each is proud to be from Collio, like the family I would like to present in this video, historical winemakers able to join tradition and modernity. In many ways, uh, these wines and their um, winemakers were and still are uh, trendsetters in the rebirth of Italian wines as uh, quality uh, wines on the uh, international scene. Um, it's, uh, this video uh, is related to uh, an historical family. Uh, is, uh, they are Yerman. I don't want to advertise any brand, but I choose this video because you can understand the high levels of uh, production they have. They have a, a very long uh, history uh, has uh, winemakers. Yerman, a history of passion coming through the ages. The founder Anton Yerman left Burgaland, the wine region in Austria, for the vines of Slovenia and eventually laid his roots in Friuli Venezia Giulia. The year was 1881. Today, Yerman is in a state of 130 hectares of vineyard, constantly communicating with the rest of the world. The main focus is always on the definitive actions that will make a one-of-a-kind wine. The soil is light and fresh, temperatures aren't too warm, and the nights are cool, so the aromas and perfumes don't dissipate from the grapes and go directly from the bunch to the wine. There is a strong bond between the Yerman family, their brand image, and their vinification style. Yerman represents a deeply artistic way of living and creating. Silvio Yerman is the one who inspired this philosophy since the 70s, taking the business to the top, first in Italy and then all over the world. Opposite but complementary to the artistic genius of Silvio stands the sense of tradition and knowledge of the father, Angelo Yerman. Speriamo che l'azienda vada avanti bene. avanti bene, perché il nostro mercato non è un mercato nazionale oppure regionale come avevo io, è mondiale. Technological innovation and architectural tradition are beautifully integrated in the new winery of Rutaz. 
The large barrels create a magic atmosphere, oak being the same material that was used 50 years ago, the same passion being passed through, generation after generation. When beautiful vineyards and grapes are grown with constant attention and care, it becomes easy to make a good wine. Capo Martino represents tradition. It's made of a blend of four indigenous grapes, Tokai, Malvasia, Ribola and Piccoli. All of them are very ancient varieties and they carry with them the value of their history. Dreams is a Chardonnay wine with a peculiar history. Born from the melody of a famous U2 song, Where the Streets Have No Name, Silvio Yerman was listening to this song when he created this wine, first naming it Where the Dreams Have No End, and then later, simply Dreams. Dreams reflects the artistic sensibility of its creator and testifies a unique style, an idea of a wine that can make you dream every day. Vintage Tunina is the wine responsible for the company's success, more than any other. Its adventure began in 1975, when Silvio Yerman decided to vinify an ancient vineyard in a modern way. The grape varieties Chardonnay, Sauvignon, Malvasia, Ribola and Picolit were planted, harvested and vinified together, with a low temperature fermentation in stainless steel in order to keep the freshness of the varieties. Vintage Tunina is an elegant masterpiece, inspired by the beauty of women. The name is an homage to the old owner of the land where the vineyard was planted, and to the poorest lover of Casanova, both of whom were named Tunina. Each wine is made to be lived, drunk, and to embody the simplest and highest value of all, sharing. The Yerman style always centers around conviviality, proximity, and communion. To share moments of pleasure with people they love. To pass on their own deep passion for fine wine to every wine lover. Yes, uh, uh, I want to, <laughs> uh, Ariana, uh, would you like to, um, to read with me these uh, words related to the winery? Yes, yeah? sure. Okay, so uh, would you like to, uh, to read in English, I read in Italian? I read in English and you will read in Italian. Okay. Wine. Vino, winery, cantina, vineyard, vigneto, vine, vigna, red wine, vino rosso, white wine, vino bianco, prosecco, is always it's prosecco, prosecco. <laughs> <laughs> wine root, Strada del vino, wine tasting, degustazione de, di vino. Cheers! Uh, cin cin, salute! <laughs> okay, thank you. You're welcome. And then uh, we're from the wine to the coastline with Grado, uh, the, which is called the Island of the Sun. It's located on an island uh, between uh, Trieste and Venice. And Grado is a very popular beach resort with a clean, shallow sea, and much entertainment for the whole family. It is called the Island of the Sun uh, because uh, the beach uh, faces southwards and uh, we can say that it's kissed by the sun all day. And, uh, you know, the Grado was a poor fisherman's village, but thanks to the excellent uh, uh, quality of its sand, it has become an, uh, an upscale uh, tourist resort. 
It is full of green um, areas, uh, bars, restaurants, playgrounds, uh, a large pine forest, and there is a marvelous long cycle lane. There are small harbors for fishing, motor and sailing boats. Uh, there are modern houses and hotels, but also ancient, elegant summer uh, residences belonged to the Austrian upper class of the 19th century. When it was part of the Austrian uh, empire, the, uh, the famous emperor, uh, Franz Josef, uh, Francis Joseph, used to spend his vacation here with his famous wife, uh, uh, Elizabeth, uh, known with the nickname of Sissi, the Empress, the Austrian em Empress Sissi. As you can see, uh, Grado is a stripe of land between the Adriatic Sea and the Laguna. Um, the sea air is pure, ventilated climate. Uh, there is a high a rate of uh, um, uh, iodine, yeah, uh, dense salt content in the water. So the place became famous for its therapeutic uh, qualities and, um, and was opened uh, the first official spa of, of the empire in 1873. Yeah. Uh, oh, 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 sorry, just a moment. Uh, miss, uh, 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 okay. Uh, so, uh, Grado is not only sun, uh, clean beach, sea, and fish restaurants, but also a place full of ancient uh, uh, history. Uh, like the Venetian islands, um, it is another safe lagoon city even if it never achieved uh, um, the incredible uh, destiny of the big Venice. Uh, and a few blocks from the seafront, uh, there is the Basilica of Santa Eufemia, which is uh, a gem of the Paleo-Christian time. Uh, the original church was built by the refugees fleeing from the um, mainland from Aquileia in the fifth and sixth century. Um, during the barbarian invasions. So there is no surpri surprise that if you visit this basilica, uh, the Basilica of Santa Eufemia, uh, you can see the floor, uh, the beautiful mosaic floor, which is in a very good condition, even if it is dated back to the late of the sixth century. It's amazing. And um, so if you go to Grado, don't miss uh, this simple but very uh, impressive church. And uh, it really gives you a sort of feeling and understanding of what uh, early Christianity might have been. Uh, it's a place to spend uh, many quiet moments in the small historical center. Uh, and uh, the center uh, can be easily uh, visited on food. Yeah. Oh, sorry. No, I want just to talk about the island, uh, this island, the island of uh, Barbana. And uh, when you go uh, by car to, to Grado, the first sight visitors get of Grado is the shiny. Uh, uh, the, the, the lagoon no? and as you can see the small small and large islands with the casoni. Casoni are uh, primitive houses of fishermen um, that feature uh, dome thatched uh, roofs. Ar arriving from the mainland you drive a long way across uh, uh, the lagoon uh, that is divided by um, a panoramic road. While driving, you can see the island of Barbana. Don't miss a trip among the isles, and in particular, this island, the sanctuary, the church of Madonna di Barbana. And it's a very important religious destination. And early summer, usually the first Sunday of July, there is a traditional event 
and it's one of the most spectacular celebrations in the region. It is called the uh, Perdon di Barbano, a fascinating parade of boats from Grado to the church, uh, which is on, on the island. So since um, centuries, the inhabitants of the island of Grado um, dedicate um, the first weekend of July to, to this feast. Uh, as uh, I mentioned before, it's a traditional uh, um, feast uh, um, by boat uh, toward the island. Uh, to thank the blessed Virgin, uh, to, to thank the um, um, uh, Saint Mary uh, for a specific reason that in the um, 13th century, uh, it is said that uh, the Madonna saved the island by a ter from a terrible plague. The scenery is amazing as the Barbana Island is characterized by the presence of an old monastery, a small jewel in the middle of the lagoon. So celebrations and events happen all over the historic center of Grado, where local street markets uh, with traditional products, concerts and food, ta uh, food tasting attract visitors from uh, um, all, all the region. Okay, so uh, I want just to remind you our last webinar, don't miss uh, um, our last meeting um, will be next Tuesday and uh, it will be about uh, the marvelous city of Trieste and uh, uh, its surroundings. We will talk about uh, uh, the famous, the literary cafes um the famous uh, not only italian but also uh, other um, european writers who decided to live and spend a long part of their lives in 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 trieste and um I want just to anticipate with uh, this small uh, this uh, description uh, made by Adam Bagley. It's a freelance writer of New, New York famous newspapers, New York Times, uh, The Guardians, and so on. And he wrote in 2011. He wrote. Uh, I want just to read uh, a part of it. Uh, Trieste is like a modernist novel, complex, layered, ambiguous. It makes you dig for significance. But don't worry, the story has a happy ending. The patient visitor will go away well satisfied and wonderfully well fed, rewarded by an experience unavailable to those looking for a quick and easy foreign fix. <laughs> okay, so... Thank I you, Patrizia. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> yeah. So thank you for this uh, uh, third leg of our journey into Friuli Venezia Giulia, and I'm really looking forward to the fourth leg to you know discovering Trieste, which is a very beautiful city, magical and full of yeah. history and cultural differences, and so with wonderful writers, very well-known internationally, well-known writers. So looking forward to the fourth event. And now let's see, we have a few questions. Um, the first, I know actually uh, someone has already answered that, that question, but I, I have a couple of questions. Let's see if there is anyone else who would have questions before me. Uh, please feel free to unmute yourselves. So, uh, yes, someone was asking, when is the seminar on Trieste next week? It's uh, on the 29th of yes. June, 29th, again, uh, Tuesday, 7 p.m. on the 29th of June. Uh, the Zoom link is the same. I always ask you, uh, if, you, if, you if it's possible to re-register uh, you again uh, uh, on our website so that you will be receiving a reminder. All the members of the Dante Society members receive a reminder through our mailing list. 
And so either you are a member or you re-register so to, to, to receive that reminder. Um, I have a question about uh, the, the Vino da meditazione. I don't know how many of you know what we mean with this term, uh, meditation wine, what, what's involved. And I hope Patrizia can tell us a little bit more about uh, this idea of a wine with which uh, we can uh, um, you know, meditate on the you know the big issues of life you know the kind of you know in a philosophy philosophical terms yeah you are right because um yeah with this expression uh, we mean that uh, there is a philosophical involvement involvement and um in these moments uh, when you taste the special wine. We, we were talking about the picolite, for example, uh, which is uh, um, uh, called also the king's wine. Uh, it's so special that uh, you don't need uh, uh, to, it, it can be drank also by itself. I mean, and uh, meditation, uh, uh, because it's a moment where you can reflect on your own uh, life uh, in general. And also um, it's a magical moment where you, you can uh, meet and uh, gather with your best friends and relatives, you know, and talk together um, and be really relaxed. Um, yeah, uh, it, uh, the, 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 the meditation involves uh, uh, many human aspects uh, uh, in that moment, yeah. And uh, it's a great, uh, um experience uh, if you can find uh, because uh, i mean you can find this kind of wine it's not easy but uh, <laughs> it's worth uh, to to try <laughs> to research it thank you thank you patricia and someone was asking can you repeat what you said about florence please uh, fatima fatima and um, so there will be a writer Robert, who um, he is a Canadian, but he studied Italian, and so he can also tell us a little bit more about his involvement with the Italian language. He wrote a book called uh, titled Florence and Me, and he will he will be talking about this book, uh, which uh, recounts his experience as a young student in Florence in the 1960s and how Florence was at the time, and then when he went back. Uh, later in life, how the, the the city has changed, you know, the uh, with the with mass tourism. So it's a totally different experience from those times when you know American tourists were still uh, a minority, and uh, and, the, uh, and we didn't have any Japanese tourists in Florence in the 1960s. So things have changed. Also, the way Italians behave uh, have changed so the uh, traditions and, and rituals have changed so it will be very interesting to listen to Robert uh, mm -hmm. in that but also we also have we'll also have our different uh, very different uh, insights into specific uh, aspects of Italian culture geography and um, and nature so as I was telling you about the rice fields in the northern part of Italy and the exotic flora in Sicily. So it will be a cultural and also geographical tour of Italy in, in these kind of encounters where, when, where you can choose uh, whether to attend uh, the, uh, an English um, presentation or a presentation in Italian if you are fluent enough in Italian, but you don't specifically need to be very advanced in your Italian because most of the presenters are also teachers of Italian, so they know that they have to speak slowly and to use simple words to when the, when speaking Italian in order for everyone to be able to understand what they are saying. And then we'll have a chat again, you know, to help uh, with you know different difficult words uh, or. Uh, unusual words, unusual turns of phrase, uh, uh, turns of a sentence. So if we don't have uh, any other 
Ah, uh, yes, Juni, and also, uh, let me see if there are any other questions. Angela Rufi is more uh, a comment, I guess. I lived in Duino near Trieste for a few years. Thank you for a little bit of nostalgia. Wonderful presentation and many thanks to all of who made this session happen. Yes, thank you for all your comments. Um, very good presentation again from Fatima. Fatima. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Thanks a lot, Patricia. So a lot of interesting uh, and uh, compliments for you, Patricia. Um, Thank you. Thank you so much. And so. uh, it's 8.30. And uh, I think if you want to still enjoy a little bit of this beautiful summer light, I think uh, we all deserve it. And so we'll see you on the 29th of June for this fourth uh, um, session of the, our webinar. Very well. Bye bye to okay. everyone. Thank you. And I will thank be you so much. Thank you for your attention and your time.